Welcome everyone uh, to the January Global Read. And as many of you know, who come often to the Global Read, it's a monthly occurrence. Uh, you can check uh, either on the homepage of the Charter for Compassion to find out um, about the upcoming Global Reads, or you can use our navigation bar under programs and, and check down uh, to see what's happening. We're exciting excited to have Rick Hansen uh, today. And um, his book came out yesterday. So are we privileged or what? Um, making great relationships. And the irony here is that um, the Charter for Compassion has made great relationship with Rick Hansen over the last year and with Jennifer uh, Nidal, who uh, is going to be the host and facilitator for today's Global Read. And let me introduce Jennifer because she'll be in turn uh, introducing uh, Rick. And Jennifer is in the UK right now in, in London, which is her home. And she's the co-founder of Compassion in Politics. She's a barrister um, and a journalist. Um, and it's been really wonderful working uh, with Jennifer over probably the last year as Rick uh, has begun the process, a long process of putting together a coalition. It's called the Global Compassion Coalition. I have a feeling that there might be some mention of that. Um, and we're excited to have uh, him. And I'm going to stop my video and turn this over to Jennifer, who will do all of the things that are necessary to keep our golden, uh, our uh, global read going. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marilyn, for that kind introduction and welcome everyone. It's wonderful to be here with the Charter and it's a great privilege and honor to be interviewing um, Dr. Rick Hansen, who is a psychologist, a fellow at the Greater Good Science Center, a best-selling author, and as Marion mentioned, the president and founder of the Global Compassion Coalition. And we're here today to talk about your latest book, Rick, which is incredible, Making Great Relationships. Um, and I want to say welcome. And of course, we have many we have many relationships, don't we? We have relationships with ourselves. We have relationships with other people. We have love relationships. We have family relationships. We have work relationships. What sort of relationships are you talking and looking about at this book? In this book, ah, well, I think all of them fundamentally. And the fundamental idea is that we construct our relationships. Yes, other people do what they do. And yes, all kinds of forces push us around. And in that context, we still have a lot of power with what we think and what we say each day to nudge our relationships gradually, steadily, but slowly in a better direction, including nudging how they impact us and how we feel inside them. Even if other people don't budge, we can find ways through the 50 simple practices in the book that are evidence-based and grounded in clinical psychology and both contemplative practice. Uh, we can find ways to feel better and to function better actually in situations that can seem really pretty intractable. So that's what the book's about. Uh, you know, I've been married 40 years. I've been a therapist for probably about that long. I've been in the trenches in business. And I uh, have learned that there are things you can do. There are things you can do. We're not helpless. There are things we can do. And that's what the book's about. And before we go further, though, I just want to express my gratitude to the Charter and the Charter for Compassion and Marilyn and everyone there. It's a legendary organization. I'm deeply honored and grateful to be able to be part of it in any way. And I encourage everybody who's listening, of course, support the Charter in any which way you can. So anyway. Wonderful, thank you. Um, why, why do you think, before we get on to the solution, let's look at the problem. Why do so many of us struggle with relationships, do you think? Why are relationships so difficult? Yeah, well, happily, some of them are good. So it's helpful to study, you know, what helps things go well. Additionally, uh, I think we're in a world in which there are a lot of external pressures and a lot of disruptions that makes things more challenging. The fundamental causes of many of our issues originate outside our front door. And it's helpful to appreciate that. 
to realize that it's not entirely your partner's fault that they're stressed and grumpy or not entirely your fault that you know you're getting impatient let's say with your kids uh, inside that context uh, things build up over time that's what I've seen again and again and again as a longtime couples counselor or family therapist is that people start out it kind of feels pretty good and then there's some sort of gears grinding some sort of misattunement that's not repaired. Ongoing successful relationships are uh, require repair, a continual process of mending. Rust never sleeps. So those little things that happen, you walk away from the interaction, something happened between my wife and me last night, and you know, it's like bumpy. If you don't deal with it somehow, perhaps entirely inside yourself, so you get to some kind of release around it, some kind of ease around it. So you're not carrying that grudge or resentment around, or you process it out loud. You talk about it in some skillful way. And the book is so much about the particular skills of repairing things in a relationship and, and building a better one. Um, I think that's a major reason. Things happen and people don't repair. Right? And so I think, you, so, go on. You, you, you talked about processing things inside yourself and your book starts with yeah. your relationship with yourself what yeah. are the key skills we need to learn for that yeah. relationship with ourselves that's great i think of three right off the top one is to be loyal to yourself that's the opening chapter of the book each of the chapters are described in terms of simple practices so get on your own side which may seem obvious to some it's missing for many they're actually on the side of others, they're for others, they're loyal to others, they're a good friend to others, they're an ally to others, they have compassion for others, they see injustice for others, but they're not on their own side. So that's very fundamental. That's like the pilot light. If you don't have the pilot light lit, you can pour gas into the furnace all you want, but it won't generate anything good. So that's one, that fundamental stance of being for yourself, not arrogant, not conceited, not better than others, but for yourself. And if you belong to a group of people, for example, girls and women, identified in terms of gender, let's say, to the extent that's you know meaningful, are routinely socialized to not get on their own side, but to over-focus and over-feel responsible for the, you know, the well-being of others to an, to an extreme. Mm -hmm. Number one. Number two, compassion for yourself. What it's like to be you matters. And if it's hard, it really matters, right? To, to feel it. And then the third thing I think is really useful, moxie. <laughs> you, know, you know, that kind of sense of strength or determination, a little bit of feisty, a little bit of okay, uh, where you're determined. It, and it's not determined to go to war or to beat other people up. But it's the, the determination that has a quality of groundedness, gravity, dignity. You think about, pick your favorite models uh, in you know, fiction or movies or in the world today who are just solid for the good. And there's a kind of fundamental self-respect in where they come from into the world. So those are three things, getting on your own side, compassion for yourself, and you know, tuning in to your own inner strength. I think those are really foundational in our relationships. Wonderful. And can you say a bit more about getting on your own side? You know, you, you talked oh, yeah. very well about the difficulties, particularly for women and girls, perhaps yeah. because of how we're socialized. Yeah. How, how, if you don't feel on your own side, how do, how do you get there? Yeah, that's great. So as a frame, I speak as a neuropsychologist too, uh, uh, grounded in what's called positive neuroplasticity. You want to help your states become traits. That may sound a little technical. You want to start, whatever you want to grow must begin with an experience of it. So you're having an experience of it, which means there's an underlying neural pattern running in your brain. And then you want to help that experience lead to lasting physical changes in your nervous system in terms of structure and function. You're converting from states to traits. You're learning, you're developing, you're cultivating. So in that frame, I've found that three things are really useful. And you can see my way of thinking. I really try to cut to what's going to help. To get on your own side, first of all, recognize that it's fair. Many of us have internalized all kinds of shoulds that get in the way of being a good ally to ourselves that somehow we think that our needs matter less than others, or that it would be vain or selfish to be supportive of ourselves. Actually, morally, 
we have the greatest duty to those over whom we have the greatest power. Uh-huh. Oh, who do you have the greatest power over? It's your future self. Who you are tomorrow, in the next minute, in the next year, that's the person actually you have a profound duty to. So clarifying that it's actually fair, it's principled, and to push back against these internalized shoulds going all the way back to childhood that somehow makes it wrong or bad to be for yourself. That's one. Second aspect of you know being for yourself is opening to and getting in touch with the ways that things are hard, you know, and also getting in touch with the longings in your heart, making room for them, not being, you know, if only a minute a day or a little more from time to time, maybe through some journaling or maybe out of a kind of opening to your own interior so that you can go, oh, wow, something important is missing in my relationships or I'm still hurt by that weird interaction with my sister-in-law last year. You know, I need to really address it, or let alone last week. Uh, so that's an opening to yourself. Like your innards matter. What it's like to be you really matters. And then the last thing that I find is really useful, and I've spoken of it before, is to know what it's like to be on the side of another person. So you're starting to call up a grounded experience of being a, an ally to someone. You're determined on their behalf, your child, your aging parent, a friend, a group of people that have suffered a great, a lot of injustice. You know what it feels like, like, yeah, that's wrong. I'm on your side about that. Know what that feels like. And then whoop, apply it to yourself. What would it be like to apply it to yourself? And often what people will bump into, I've done this with many people, is it'll seem, like alien or somehow wrong to apply it to themselves, which then makes you realize, wait a second, why is it wrong or unfair to apply this ordinary thing to myself? You know, if we morally are to be caring and decent to all beings, well, all beings includes the one who wears your name tag too. Beautiful. And you can feel my moxie about it. You know, maybe just internalize that for yourself. I love, I love it. And you're making me wonder, though. So you're your own ally. You've got that oomph and you're standing up for yourself. Yeah. Doesn't that increase the likelihood of conflict and isn't part of Great what question. you're writing about how to manage conflict. That's it. That's really right. Exactly right. Curiously, the more that people actually have this healthy, not aggressive, not arrogant, healthy self-respect, what we would wish for others to have our children, our friends, those we care about, the world, we, we claim for ourselves as well. When people do that, what's really interesting is that little things don't build up to, some, to, some, to an explosion. Second, because people already have a certain sense of care for themselves and respect for themselves, they get less hungry uh, about pulling it in from others, and they also get less reactive when it's a thin soup coming their way from others. And they become more willing to sustain uh, an intimacy with others and open into the depths of real friendship, real love, real connection, because they know they're going to take care of themselves in the process. So actually, this is a factor of things going well in relationships. And, you know, probably two thirds of my book, because it's two thirds of what life's about with people is dealing with issues. Everything is really groovy. Everything's fine. When we're all swimming in the same direction, we all love each other. There you are in the hammock, you're getting a manicure and a pedicure and you know, umbrella drinks are coming your way. <laughs> That's easy. But what do we do when our roommates, our families, our coworkers, our, our partners, our children, our parents, when, there's, when there are issues there? And that's what the book is very much about, what to do when, because I just saw it again and again and again. People start out with, you know, they, they say something, and then the other person says something. Well, now what do you do? Or you say something, they say something, you say something, and then they say that thing. Now what do you do? All right? That's what the book's very much about, very practical. Now what do you do when, including in conflict. But it's on this foundation you know, of taking care of yourself. And the other foundation, which is the second of six parts in the book, is about warming your own heart, opening your heart, expanding the field of compassion, resting in a more in a centered place in which you wish others well and people move through that field, um, in a sense, unconditionally. Uh, your, your fundamental good heartedness and open heartedness in the world uh, is not contingent on what other people do. 
you address, you know, how can I put, you adjust rather your relationships with people depending on what they do. There's nothing in this book that's about being a patsy or a doormat exactly, but it actually is good for you. It's healing for you to rest in a kind of fundamental open heartedness and good heartedness because you can feel it in yourself and whatever lack there might be in the caring and the love flowing your way and it's often lacking many people disappoint in the real world what do we do about that but the outflow of care concern commitment to justice open-heartedness and so forth um, is within our power and it heals us and feeds us and nurtures us as it flows through us out into the world so it sounds as if there's something in there about not allowing yourself to be victimized not by sure. what others do, because yeah. that is a common pattern that many of us fall into in relationships, the kind of how could you and don't you understand? How, how do we avoid falling into that pit? You mean that kind of complaint? Or, or... Well, when we're wronged, you just said oh, yeah. that the unconditional love has to flow irrespective of of how the other person behaves but there's right. a hook isn't there when someone oh, lets yeah. us down there's oh, yeah. a hook and we want to go after them and get them to make it better You're exactly right so first i'm not saying what i'm saying is sort of like a universal rule it's more like pragmatically what helps and we start where we are so it may well be impossible understandably for someone to extend full loving kindness to the current tyrants in the world who are fomenting wars and causing so much suffering in many places. Okay, but what about your neighbor? Can you find a fundamental unwillingness inside to hate them, right? To start there, and then you expand out in general. Second, it's incredibly important to be able to assert yourself and have the kind of skills and the self-respect, that's why I started there, that can support you in effective assertiveness. So let's suppose something does happen and someone does something and you feel hurt as a result. What, what works? What's helpful? I think first what's helpful is to recognize that you're upset, to be mindful enough. And a lot of people, um, it takes a while for them to realize that something has happened because they're not that in touch with themselves for all kinds of reasons, including maybe there's a lot of pain down there inside. They don't wanna be in touch with themselves. That was true for me. I wandered into adulthood, you know, numb from the neck down. And it's taken me a while to become open to my own interior because I didn't wanna feel it initially. Okay, so you recognize something has bothered you. Second, respect the fact that you've gotten bothered. Take it seriously. Don't just brush it off or blame yourself, you know, or just, or keep on going slow down for suffering. I have a teacher, a friend, who's, I asked him what his personal practice was one time. He said, I stopped for suffering, including mm -hmm. your own. If only to tap the brakes, but at least register it. And then, uh, you know, you find compassion for yourself and you start to make a plan. It's helpful to, rec to sort out what actually happened here. Did I misunderstand something? Was the comment from another person inadvertent? Be careful about the intentions that we attribute to other people. Sometimes we're accurate. Oftentimes they didn't do it on purpose. They just didn't understand something, even though it had an impact on us. It was inadvertent from them. Okay, you start to sort out what happened. And then you decide what to do about it. Sometimes we'll just let it go. We'll realize it's just going to cause too much trouble to deal with that person at work. There's no basis for us to get into a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. On the other hand, I'm not going to do any more team projects with that person in the future. I'm gonna take a step back. One of my chapters is titled, Resize the Relationship. Sometimes we have to do that. Um, but maybe let's say you decide to talk about it with them, right? Uh, there are certain things that increase the odds of it going well. Speaking from the heart, uh, sharing your direct experience without blaming the other person or accusing them, just simply stating what it was like to be you. Uh, listening trying to understand what it was like to be them. What happened over there? In, in ways that are culturally appropriate, given your own setting and business setting or a family setting, friendships, you know, some, there are different ways to do this, but you're, you're, you're getting to it. And then move in the direction of, if it's appropriate, for a request from now on. So many people argue about the past 
and they get into deadlocks about the past. You did it. I didn't really do it. Well, you said it with that tone. I didn't have that tone. Round and round they go. You know, <laughs> what about making agreements for the future? Making requests, not, not demands from now on. And then implicit in that request, though, is that you're going to decide what to do if they blow you off. Or you're going to decide what to do if they say sure and then they keep doing the same thing again and again and they seem clearly unwilling to make the most fundamental agreement of all to keep their agreements with you right mm -hmm. to take their agreements with you as seriously as they do let's say with people at work or the you know the fellow down the street so um that that process just to finish to give you some room to breathe here <laughs> you know in my fire hose of, of suggestions right. uh, yeah is to you know and, and I find actually that you, over time, we sometimes will discover that another person is unwilling to repair. And if someone is unwilling to repair the lack of repair in a key relationship, that's a major red flag. Sometimes you're stuck with them in various ways, but at least you can resize the relationship inside your own mind. You can maybe go through some grieving when you start to really recognize what you're dealing with over there. You know, it's the disappointment, um, the unfulfilled longings for a certain kind of relationship that you just realize this is not going to happen. Uh, you may need to do that. On the other hand, my experience, 80% of the time, you know, if you come into conflicts or issues or misunderstandings with good intent, fundamental attitude of uh, you're not letting hate invade your heart, or if it's invaded your heart, you <laughs> help it out the door as soon as you can, uh, and you're reasonably skillful about it, you know, most people gradually budge over time, and um, and it does get better over time. Yeah, I don't know, have yeah. you found that yourself? You're, I've, I know you personally, you're very skillful <laughs> interpersonally. One never feels that one is, but I, I love, you've got such a beautiful way of expressing the things, never let hate invade your heart. That's beautiful. And I also loved resizing, you know, so you're literally, someone isn't this big person in your face, but you're yeah. psychologically diminishing the space they occupy in your, in your world. It, do you have a particular visualization or process to help with that resizing I, I love it i'm definitely going to use it well i do actually and and uh i'm gonna i'm gonna draw the blob okay our, our daughter has actually praised this visual so all right so uh i hope you could see it in the camera you it's pencil no circle there have you got a sharp yeah i'm gonna do it with a pen okay for those who don't know rick rick will always have a yellow pad somewhere within reach don't think I, this is a unique one-off event. Rick is never far from his yellow pad. You know, I'm taking things seriously when I pull out the yellow pad. Okay, so here's how our relationship starts. Is that better? Mm -hmm. No, you. Yeah, you, it's a oh. pen. Yeah, you Tell can see. Tell us what it. we're seeing. We can You're see a circle. A, a circle. You can see a circle. Yeah. So the whole relationship, and then stuff happens, right? So let's suppose in this b b booming, budding friendship. You start talking with the person about politics and you realize, oh, wow, we are a million miles away on that, all right? And then another few things happen and you go out for drinks and you realize they can't stop at two glasses of wine. They just keep on going, whoa, we're not gonna go out and have drinks again. That got a little weird, right? Okay, and then something else happens. You do a work project or, and you realize they, they don't, they're not serious about keeping their agreements or being on time about anything. It's just, it's a big swirl, like, whoa, can't rely on them. So that's all right, that's ain't gonna happen. So carve that part out. All right, great. So then what you're left with, can you okay, see? Okay, we're just gonna have a look. So what you've done is you've drawn, carved out bits of the circle yep. that are no-go areas. Is yep. that right? That's right. And so what you're left with is the parts that remain in the blob and you realize okay that's the size of the relationship that is actually scaled to its true foundations and um there you are i don't know if you can kind of see what i've done yeah yeah i, have I found this to be one of the most it. so helpful. it's like, almost like a land mass in an ocean yeah well said like for example i have a dear friend um who's very um 
<clears throat> fixated on his politics. I've just learned, never talk with him about it. We just carved that out. You know, meanwhile, we, we're, we were rock climbing partners. We could talk about adventures we had, you know, so forth. Um, my mom, uh, my mom was an extremely loving person who showed her love a lot by helping others to improve themselves. Well, that became sort of a power struggle. And, you know, I'd, and then what I helped myself do after a while, I realized I had tossed the baby out with the bathwater because she loved me dearly. So I started ignoring her suggestions. I just carved those out of the blob and just I just looked past her personality, which was judgmental and kind of controlling out of love to the warm heart behind it all is as if I was looking through a lattice work of vines and with thorns and brambles mm. to this warm fire. It's a warm campfire on the other side. That's another way to resize. Uh, sometimes you realize that, you know, this friendship, uh, Let's have lunch once a year, catch up. That's good. That's about right. Uh, you know, resizing is fantastic, and including it, you do it inside your own mind. Uh, if you're still in a situation where you have to see them every day, like someone down the hall at work, uh, you just internally just take a big step back. Uh, there's this term in psychology, distance in the service of attachment. Sometimes it's actually in the service of attaching to take a step back from people. That's so interesting. So you don't, as you say, throw the baby out with the bathwater. And it sounds as if you're also saying we look for the good and ignore the bad. Right. Or or deal with it. Right. And to be really, really clear, um, if, if we're resizing, it's because we see the bad, if you will. In other words, we we're see not in denial. We're not pretending it doesn't no. exist. We just start to realize uh, that the best predictor of the future is the past. I mean, some people. Uh, it's really worth it to really repair. Like, and I find often people in a couple, let's say a long-term relationship, maybe they're they're married or functionally married, maybe they have children. Um, I find a lot of the time people don't repair when they could, and that creates growing distance over time. They may still love each other, but they've really drifted apart, and the fabric of their relationship has been cut thread by thread. So now, also, it's vulnerable. And something happens, you know, an attractive other person swirls into the space or somebody gets sick or there's a, you know, a stressful problem they've got to solve, um, you know, because those threats, so many threads have been cut over time. So on the one hand, I think it's important to really ask yourself, should I invest more in repair? Other times you just start, you just realize, oh, okay. Uh, the cost of trying to repair, the awkwardness, the weirdness, you know, the risks that the other person will hold it against me later it's not worth it and sometimes quietly or maybe you've tried to repair a couple of times and you could just see no there it's not going to change and then you just in your mind you take a little step back you take a little step back that's what i'm talking about so in this process there's also acceptance and perhaps loss and grieving yeah. the bits that you've had to step back from exactly and and to be clear this is just a piece of what helps you to make great relationships, but it's a really important one. This kind of realism that will often involve a certain disenchantment, not in a negative sense of like despair or blah, but more like you're waking up from the spell. Like there's a part of me, my, my, my wife teased me recently, said one of your faults, Rick, is you really see the good in people. <laughs> and you know, there's some truth to it. There's this like naive, innocent, childlike quality in me that sort of, you know, presumes things. And that can create an enchantment. We can get enchanted or we can be enchanted by other people and their spin, their BS, or the way that they keep pushing responsibility onto our side of the street when in fact they have a lot of responsibility for things that have gone wrong, right? We sort of wake up from that. That realism is really helpful. And then you also see that alongside Often you'll see that alongside the parts that bug you about another person, and this is so important, that not to get fixated on that one tile in the mosaic of the relationship that's flashing red, because the brain has what's called a negativity bias, or as I put it, it's like Velcro for bad experiences, but Teflon for good ones. We naturally get fixated on that thing they said, or that annoying habit they have of leaving their dirty dishes in the sink, or burping, or, you know, whatever else 
breathing. <laughs> breathing. Yeah. Can you yeah, believe it? They're breathing. Swallowing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Um, and so uh, what I'm saying as well, for their sake, but also for your sake, see the, see the flashing red tile. Okay. The flashing red line, but also see the gray and the green. In other words, the neutral and the, the good tiles, the green tiles. The person is dealing with a lot of issues, maybe. They're doing well considering the load they're carrying or the childhood they had or the job they have or the health issues they're dealing with, right? See those things. See their good heartedness. You know, see the ways that they, they do do things well. I mean, that kind of wider view is really helpful too. Even neurologically, technically, when you widen your view, when you feel your whole body, that's a wider view. When you see the room as a whole, when you imagine a situation or a relationship as a whole, you take that bird's eye view, even you just get a sense of reality unfolding. The Big Bang is really big. <laughs> Two trillion galaxies right now. That's a lot of galaxies averaging 100 billion stars each, like our own, right? Wow, it's big universe. Long sweep of time, nearly 14 billion years already. That neurologically activates circuits on the sides of your brain, technically, that give you that bigger picture and quiet circuitry in the midline that gets caught up in rumination and negativity and resentment and taking things oh so personally again and again. So these things are really useful. And as you do this, you become a lot more effective and stronger at sticking up for yourself um, and you know making things better in your relationships. And I know you also write in, in the book about boundaries. Can you talk a bit about yeah. these misapplied boundaries? It, it's a complicated business setting boundaries and it's often misapplied, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's true. Um, <clears throat> there's a, you know, the proverb, fences make for good neighbors. And the if you think about it, uh, autonomy supports intimacy. That's a fancy way of putting it. That if you don't have if the capacity uh, and if you don't feel entitled in a healthy sense to uh, exercise your own agency, to decide for yourself these three really important things, to claim for yourself the right in the inner sanctuary of your being, to see what you see, value what you value, care about what you care about, and plan what you plan, then it's really hard to sustain deep relationships because you get so buffeted by other people, overwhelmed or flooded by them, or frankly controlled by them. You know, and for many people, it may seem obvious, but they actually don't claim for themselves the right to see what they see, care about what they care about, and plan what they plan in their innermost being. And that's a good place to start. If you've got a chronic issue in a relationship or a missed op opportunity, you think it could be better and you don't know what to do, start there. Second, um, on the basis of that then, uh, by establishing that kind of autonomy, which includes some boundaries, recognizing that just because you're upset about something doesn't necessarily mean I did something wrong. Mm -hmm. Just because you want something from me doesn't necessarily mean I have to give it to you. Or this is a really useful one. Just because you think I committed a moral fault and I should be ashamed of myself and feel guilty and remorseful, that doesn't necessarily mean that I actually committed a moral fault even though maybe there's an opportunity for skillful correction going forward. Mm. That's an incredibly useful distinction. Just because they're blaming you and rattling on doesn't mean you need to take that on board while still potentially seeing, okay, I'm going to operate a little differently next time because I get it. I, I used a word that hits you hard. I can now understand that. I wasn't trying to hurt you. I, I wasn't deliberately being mean, which would be a moral fault, for example. Um, but, you know, I'm going to be more skillful going forward. Just that distinction right there, that boundary between moral fault and skillful correction is really, really helpful. I love that. That's another great Rickism, skillful correction. Yeah. How, how do you know when you need to correct yourself skillfully and when it's the other person that just needs to correct themselves? Often it's both, right? And that's where another really important, you know, theme I talk about in the book um, is, I call it the 80-20 rule, uh, where, you know, where you put 20% of your focus on how they could be better. There's a place for that. And there's a lot in the book and in effective relationships, how to 
you know, how to make a skillful request, how to name an issue skillfully, how to enter into a difficult conversation. You know, there's a lot about that. And, and stating clearly what you want rather than something vague and euphemistic, like, couldn't we all sort of do our share in the house? <laughs> or can't we be nice? It sound really well, doesn't it? Well, what does that mean? <laughs> like the person could say, oh, yeah, I believe in that. And then still, you know, each day you're doing two hours more housework and childcare than they are, which is routine in many families, right? Um, typically tilted against women. And so um, in heterosexual situations. So see that part. But we have limited influence over others. After we name something, we state the facts that we see after we name a, a request. Um, after that, what about practicing what I call unilateral virtue? Mm. Where for your own sake, you deliberately zero in on taking maximum reasonable responsibility for what you can do. Reasonable, as you decide. So you just, and you start uh, among other things, you think about, okay, what's my personal code of conduct? How do I want to operate? What are the lines in which, from a sports metaphor, I want to operate, even if they're cheating? I'm going to call them on the cheating over time, and I'm going to resize the relationship if they keep doing that. But meanwhile, I'm not going to let myself be hijacked by malice or hate or ill will. I mean, it may arise and I may need to like huff and puff a bit, uh, including with somebody else perhaps or my therapist. But when it comes down to it, how do I want to be? You know, personally, uh, I imagine that there's a video camera in the corner of my, my room that's recording what's happening. And I think, oh, that might be played before the board of psychology or my kid's <laughs> wedding reception or my funeral. Like, what do I want to see there? You know, like, okay, your code of conduct also, Take maximum reasonable responsibility for zeroing out their complaints. What are their wants? What are their, you know, desires? Or what have they said? We often know. If you, I've done this with couples routinely. I say, okay, just write down what you think are the top three things your partner wants from you. Usually we know, right? Usually we know. Um, so if you start taking care of your own side of the street in that unilateral way, it's your best odd strategy for getting good behavior from other people while giving you a sense of agency and self-respect along the way. And what starts to happen is it dial dials down the heat in relationships because you're removing any reasonable basis for them to take issue with you. And you can enjoy what is the Buddha called the bliss of blamelessness. That's a bliss I love. I just want to know that I'm like the good enough human each day. You know, what's a good enough human? Like, uh, which includes like putting in skillful correction and eliminating their cause for complaint, which also is good for you. I love getting people off my back, you know, and what then what starts to happen is what remains is what's unreasonable or over the top on their complaints. And also what starts to remain is uh, the stuff that they're doing that you have good reason to ask them to do differently in the future. But now, after a few days in a row, or even a few weeks in a row of unilateral virtue, you're on the moral high ground. You're in a much stronger position in skillful ways, skillful and virtuous ways. You're in a much stronger position to actually get your needs met from the other person. And just think about what's it like to be with people who take what you want seriously and really want to get to the bottom of it like what did i what happened here what do you want going forward how could i be the next time and they actually implement correction wow. amazing you want to be with them you want to work with them <laughs> you know uh you want to you want to sleep with them you know you want to stay friends with them you want to raise children with them you know you want to you want to cooperate with them you want to be a good neighbor with them well that's what you're going to get yourself if you know this this higher road approach which for me actually was great because I grew up in a home in which my parents were very loving, but they were traditional and they were kind of fault finding and critical and controlling. And I'm pretty rebellious in my nature. <laughs> I'm like an amiable rebel. And, <laughs> and I don't, don't try to push everyone. <laughs> amiable rebel. You know, just don't quit pushing me around. And I, you start to realize, no, 
when you start giving them what they want, that's one of my chapters, give them what they want. Another one's called admit fault and move on. You know, when you start operating that way, you realize, no, I'm not being your puppet. I'm not being pushed around by you. I'm actually claiming power unilaterally for myself to judge for myself how to be a better partner and to actually do it going forward. Like that's a strong, powerful way to be. Now, all of that makes beautiful and perfect sense, but but we humans, we're not always rational and often we bring our childhood patterns to relationships. Oh, yeah. There's a bit of us, we know what the right thing to do is, but but somehow doing it feels like capitulating or surrendering and losing a bit of one's own autonomy. Right. Uh, how in the real world oh, yeah. do you do this? Well, I'm very in the real. So often what will happen is that 1% of... For, they're like the four stages of, of growth. I'll just summarize them. S stage one, you're doing it. You don't even realize you're doing it. You come home, you start grumping around. You don't even realize you're doing that. Stage two, you realize you're doing it. You wish you didn't do it, but you keep doing it. Stage three, uh, the tendency arises, but you exercise deliberate control and you don't do it. Stage four, the tendency doesn't even arise. It's really helpful path. And this can be summarized as stage one is unconscious incompetence. Stage two is conscious incompetence. Stage three is conscious competence. And stage four is unconscious competence. So there's a progression over time. And it often starts in stage two with 1% of you wants to do it differently next time. 99% of you is caught up in old habits, reactivity, the impact of trauma, your childhood, very understandably. And so there's a fundamental choice. Do I want to help myself gradually grow 1% to 2% and then 3% and then 10% and then the tipping point around 51 or 60% from there. So that, that's a key thing. Second, like I said in the beginning, from states to traits. In other words, to help ourselves start to experience what it feels like in the body to go a better way. What's it feel like to be on your own side? What's it feel like to be self-respecting and to realize I can just let those words go by me. I don't have to let them land from those other people. I can be like a deeply rooted tree through, through whose leaves those winds are blowing. Whoa, that's pretty intense, but I don't have to own it. I can create a boundary. I'm not implicated in your mind stream right now. You know what I mean? I'm going to try to be skillful going forward. Like, what's that feel like? What's that feel like? What's it feel like to take responsibility for their complaints and to just gradually eliminate them one by one by one? Doesn't that feel good? Well, then when you start to recognize what that feels like, and then you do things I talk about, about taking in the good, staying with the experience, helping it really sink in, increasingly you become different. You shift, you learn, you grow, you, you cultivate, you develop. And that's the gradual process. It takes time. It's often best to start when it's where it's easy with that good friend that rather than your nightmare parent-in-law <laughs> or your ex, <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, you know, start easy and then build out from there. But it's very possible. You know, I've been in, um, I've been in the growth business since I was basically a teenager. I went off to college at 16 and the height of the human potential movement. And I've really come to see that I'm never bet against the human heart. Never bet against the human heart. If people are helping themselves a few minutes every day to grow a little bit, to heal a little bit, the possibilities are boundless. It's that nudge. It's to make that effort a little bit every day and keep building bit by bit, day by day over time. That's where there's tremendous possibility. And there's tons of both official research that demonstrates these possibilities over the lifespan and also lots of personal examples. There are many examples of people uh, who are, grew up in situations with tremendous poverty and in, or in trauma, injustice and horrible things, you know, um, a thousand times worse than my own kind of semi unhappy childhood. Uh, right. And yet they too found love in their heart. They too grew over time. They too 
uh, found ways to be more skillful and, and, and contributing in the world. And wow, considering the hard knocks they experienced um, and they did it, each of us can do it as well. Mm, that's so beautiful. And it gives so much hope, the idea that we unilaterally can make changes that will improve the situation. I, I just have one more question. Um, and then I want to talk to you about how we apply this to the wider world. Yeah, great. Um, Tina Turner, what's love got to do with it? How much of this is alchemy and magic? Or can you actually turn any sow's ear into a silk purse? Huh, that's interesting. Uh, on the one hand, it, my deep experience and, and view is that innately, just biologically, in the core of everyone's being, who has, let's say, fundamentally a relatively normal you know, human body in the core of everyone's being is a fundamental um, field, I'll call it, or core of awareness, uh, positivity, lovingness, if you will, basic decency, uh, peacefulness, and, and desire to contribute, desire to construct rather than destroy, deep mm -hmm. down inside everyone. And then that, for, for me, and others may not relate to it, either fine um it edges into something infinite mysterious timeless and transcendental okay i think that's really true and on top of it people vary you know you certainly see some people um who they're just not going to budge and then you have to figure out what you're going to do and which may involve some as you said earlier some grieving or mourning for the loss of hope and what it could have been and what you wish for and what should have been which should have been. They should not have treated you that way. That that's really true. So I'm so in that context of realism, then the question is, what does love have to do with it? And um, it's a terrible thing to feel that your power to love has been taken from you. And many of us, me included in my teen years, suppress the love we have for others for various reasons, including to withhold it in our war, my war with my parents. And so uh, to be able, but that's damaging to you. So to reclaim your freedom, I just gave a little talk recently about this in my online meditation program, love freely, to retain the freedom to, I'm using the word love very broadly here, mm. to deliberately wish others well, or minimally not wish them harm. Sometimes we just have to start with not wishing them harm. You know, to just disengage from our vengeful, sadistic fantasies of harm for them, which we're vulnerable to as human animals, big monkeys, disengage from that. And then see if you can expand a basic sense of, of recognition for their suffering and wishing that they weren't suffering so much. Uh, and then see if you can expand that to a fundamental kind of stance of seeing good in them, uh, things that are good about them. Um, can you expand that further? to a fundamental open-heartedness and warmth toward them even. Even as you separate from them and distance from them, you can feel warmly and compassionately toward people you never want to see again. Or you recognize that you're never going to see again and that's probably a good thing, uh, right? You, and, and then in the process of that, a very interesting thing happens. You feel lived more and more by love. Mm -hmm. You feel lived by its power. It's like an arising wellspring, an inexhaustible wellspring in its love in all its broad forms. I'm using the term quite broadly, pro-social, quite broadly. Um, <clears throat> and as it flows through you, as I said earlier, it protects you. You know, if you want to, for me, um, I, I find that people who upset me and I'm round, round, round about it, I never get free of that upset until two things happen inside myself, along with often seeing them realistically. One, I have to take responsibility for whatever my part was in the matter, which sometimes is zero, but my willingness to take, to scour my mind and to go after every molecule of personal responsibility gives me the freedom to recognize what I'm not responsible for. Take responsibility and second, find compassion for them because it frees us in our upsets with others to have compassion for them. And more broadly, even this kind of lovingness, it feeds us, it heals us, it protects us, it strengthens us, it ennobles us in, in the proper and good sense of that word, is that what is worthy and honorable and valuable 
it ennobles us to open to love flowing through us. And wow, do we need a world today in which that's the case? You know, you, you opened up the larger conversation and you and I are founding together with a, you know, some other colleagues and friends around the world, uh, this global compassion coalition, a coalition that will eventually be big enough to be strong enough to actually have the clout to change systemic sources of suffering that have been intractable for thousands of years, notably inequalities of wealth and power that are kind of the underlying engine of so much systemic injustice in the world that causes so much suffering, you know, to, to claim the power of love, right? Um, anyway, so that's, that's a, my dear hope. And I have a vision and a notion of, you know, some tipping point in humanity, a hundred million, maybe a billion, probably about there at scale of people who are just committed to being strong from the heart, the strong heart each day, uh, crossing national boundaries, crossing divisions, uh, cross, crossing isms of all kind, committed to the common good, joined by one thing, a commitment to the common good, right? And which is grounded really in compassion and justice, right? Telling the truth and playing fair and, you know, having an openness to suffering, stop for suffering in, in others and yourself. Uh, boy, if we had a world like that, wouldn't that be the one we'd want to give our children? Wouldn't that, that be the one we'd want to live into? Wouldn't that be the one that we wish had been handed to us by our ancestors a thousand or a hundred years ago? That's the world we can make today only through joining together though at a scale that's big enough to make that kind of difference. And that's what you and I are doing, of course, in the Global Compassion Coalition. And there are so many of us, you know, the vast majority of people on this planet don't want to see the suffering that we see on a daily basis. And yet right. somehow we haven't all joined together. And, and, you know, the Charter for Compassion is one of our really important and precious partners in this endeavor. And the work that yeah. they're doing is really extraordinary. But if we can join with the Charter and we can join with all the organizations in the space across the globe who want the same things, as well as all the individuals who want the same things, there can be more of us for the solution than there are stuck yeah. in the That's right. Yeah, the charter, what a pioneer. Um, mm -hmm. Karen Armstrong and everyone else, in, including Marilyn involved with it, and Linda mm -hmm. Vries, who's managing our tech on the side and all kinds of other people. Uh, what a beautiful thing. And it's that notion, we're stronger together. It's really straightforward. We're stronger together. And that's what our ancestors did for 97% of the time, the human species, 300,000 years, 97% of that time until the last 10,000 years, you know, our ancestors lived on the daily basis of compassion and justice, caring and sharing in, in their groups. They, they were stronger together. Yeah, they bickered. Yeah, they argued. Maybe somebody shoved somebody once in a while, right? Yeah, uh, hey, I want more meat. <laughs> what happened? Or <laughs> you took the banana, uh, right? But on the whole, human life was organized around caring and sharing. And what you and I are up to, as you well know, right, Jennifer, is that we're looking for a restoration of that to, to, to come back to our home, to come home to our nature as fundamentally um, caring and, and, and decent people. So many of us say we live at odds with our nature. We practice these values in our homes with those that we're closest to. And then we leave our front door and we find ourselves in a culture that yeah. insists that we trample on others to get to the finishing line, which is never, of course, the finishing line. It's a, it's an illusion. It's like the horizon. It just keeps disappearing the more we pant yeah. and race and try to cross it. And we trample and we elbow when really the answer is, as you say, just to stop. And I think people forget that none of us would exist if it weren't for compassion. Yeah. No child would survive, but for yeah. compassion. You know, we all exist today because of compassion. I'm just yeah. going to chime in here only because this has gone so quickly. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much. And I apologize to Barbara because I have a feeling that we have only one question uh, and, and people are indicating that they have to leave because of other meetings. Um, and I'm going to send you Barbara's question, Rick, maybe you would be willing to, um, to respond to it. Well, I but, can see it. I can speak to it quickly okay. right now. I'd love to. Okay, go ahead. 
Oh, okay, great. So, uh, and maybe others can see it. I'll read it just for others. Um, let's see, my biggest challenge is my disappointment when people behave unethically, especially those close to me. I have high moral standards and I am working on not expecting the same from others. Okay, so a few things here. Uh, on the one hand, and I have to watch this myself, we have to be careful about righteousness. It's so easy to get caught up in righteousness with an edge of anger. And it's interesting that of all the so-called negative emotions, notably anger, sadness, um, fear, and shame, anger is the one that feels rewarding and releases neurochemicals of dopamine and norepinephrine that feel good. So careful about that. On the other hand, there's it, we, we, can, we cannot avoid values. Trying to avoid values is a value. We cannot avoid values. We can own our values and be clear about them. And I think it's really important to look out at the world and to be prepared to have a kind of moral confidence about what we see. If you think about it in the world today, on the right, especially the religious right, they've claimed for themselves, you know, that they get to, you know, say what should happen. And a lot of other people are backfooted. On the other hand, I think it's really appropriate for those who care about the common good to have the moral confidence to speak up about it and to speak up about the harms that others are doing. One of the, the fundamental enabling factor of the emergence and evolution of human altruism and compassion and so many other good things is, is being able to call out and frankly punish, uh, name and shame, typically freeloaders. If you can't create consequences for freeloaders and for people who externalize their costs, they dump their costs in the common space, the, uh, the common ground, it'll just keep going. So it's really important, including on the internet, on Facebook, on Twitter, and otherwise, to have the moral confidence to identify and call out, you know, uh, people who violate reasonable standards and are harming a lot of other people, as a broad statement. And then we're in the messy territory of daily life. Uh, people can get very edgy when essentially you're accusing them of a moral fault. Uh, and, you know, it's important to be thoughtful about that. Over time, we start to see what other people are going to do. Maybe we try to repair. Maybe we try to repair and they just basically say, I don't accept your should. I don't have that same standard. I don't see it that way. And then you have to take that into account. What are we going to do going forward? Um, I've definitely had to, you know, I've been kind of stunned sometimes by how prepared people are to be cold, callous, even cruel. Uh, Paul Gilbert, our friend and ally in the Compassion Coalition, done a lot of work on callousness and cruelty and how vulnerable we are to that. I'm kind of stunned by the casual mistreatment of others, the lack of compassion. That said, what are we going to do? Um, and often what we're left with doing is resizing the relationship and not letting the poison of righteous anger invade our heart and being careful about it. You know, I've had to be careful about that kind of look of exasperation. It's so easy for me. I can hardly believe it, you know. And uh, Jennifer's training me <laughs> in that regard because we work together. Uh, and it's a good thing, my wife too. Uh, and uh, anyway, that's that's my two cents about that. But it's still, meanwhile, it's okay to see what you see. It's okay to see what you see. A lot of the, the later chapters in the book, one of them is called Vote. We vote in lots of ways, not just at the ballot box. And one of the most fundamental forms of voting, of voting is to look at others who are acting in harmful, unkind, unjust ways and, and, and to communicate even just with our calm, fearless eyes that we see them. We see that we, what they're doing and we do not approve. We do not agree, we do not approve. Um, it's not that we're gonna throw bombs at them, it's just that no. And that has a lot of moral weight. That's what worked in our hunter-gatherer bands, and we need to find ways to help that work at scale. That's the issue in the world today. How do we make, how do we help what worked in our hunter-gatherer bands work at scale with 8 billion people? We don't have to invent ways of living together well. We just have to enable them to operate at scale, the whole human tribe, all 8 billion of us today. Right. Thank you, Rick and Jennifer. Um, we really are at the top of the hour, and I do want to quickly share some of the things that are, are coming up. Uh, tomorrow, we uh, have 
the most incredible project uh, that was founded by a young person and a whole team of people coming together in Project Fuel from India. But their project is really being utilized in Europe as, as well. And so if anyone's around, but even if you're not, if you're interested, please sign up and we'll make certain that you uh, get the recording as people who are here today will get the recording. Next Global Read, uh, Joanna Macy and Chris Johnson. I think that because of uh, a number of circumstances in the life of Joanna Macy, Chris is going to be the person uh, who is going to be uh, the primary uh, presenter, along with Ellen Safati, uh, who is part of our Global mm -hmm. Education Institute. And by the way, Ellen's offering a course right now on how to be an activist. And though it started on Monday, uh, it's still open for people who might uh, be interested. And then, of course, we have this strange person who I'm not quite really sure who it is, uh, but uh, his name is Rick Hansen, and he's going to be doing a course uh, with our Charter Education Institute on dealing with anxiety. Uh, and so it starts on February 13th. So we're, we're anxious for that. Um, and there's Ellen's course again. The other thing is that we have an introduction to compassionate listening um, with Catherine Coy. This is a repeat. It, it was such a, an overwhelming course for people the last time. Um, we're so happy that um, everyone has been so involved in participating in our global reads, our ed forms, which happen uh, the third Thursday of every month, our film series, and all of the other things. And as many of you know, we are in the middle of 40 Days of Peace, which started on, um, for us, the 13th of January. And so every single day, if you go to the charter calendar, there is something happening. And we're, uh, this is the fourth year that we've done this. And we hope that you'll take advantage of that programming. Again, Jennifer, Rick, thank you so much. Um, oh, thank you both. And thank you everyone who's participated. And thanks everyone for staying. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Marilyn. Good job. <laughs>